The purpose of the ASL lecture series is to provide professional communication development in ASL and culture to motivate our audience to learn more about deaf culture and ASL and to provide opportunities for people to experience formal and academic ASL in a presentation style. Hello to everyone. If you're just joining now, my name is Ren Putz. Currently, I'm working at NTID as a creative producer. I'm really excited because tonight our presentation is by Daniel Durant. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to work with Daniel on the set of Spring Awakening. That was a Broadway musical. And during that production, I found that Daniel was one of the most talented and hardworking people I have ever worked with. So I am thrilled to be here tonight with Daniel. Hi, Ren. So go for it. Didn't mean to interrupt the introduction. Um, I've known Ren during Spring Awakening. We have a couple of ways to sign it. Uh, the two of us, um, we started the production in Los Angeles, and then we took it to Broadway in New York City, and Ren joined us in New York. I think uh, this was your first time in, uh, in a Broadway play, correct? She came in, and when we, we opening night, we went through the show, and then it just so happened one of the nights of the performances, Ren worked as an understudy which means she was ready to take on another character's role if they became sick or if for some other, whatever reason they couldn't make it, she would take over. I gotta tell you, it is not an easy job. One night, she was all ready to go on the performance in full character. I was so impressed with her. She did a, she's a great actress and she was great. I know she's gonna do well in her future career as well. Thank you, Daniel, that was really sweet of you. Um, well, Daniel grew up in Minnesota, went to college both at RIT, NTID, and Gallaudet. He has been in multiple Deaf West stage performances. Obviously, Spring Awakening was one of them, and I really did enjoy working with you on that. He's also in TV shows and film. Um, one example is Switched at Birth, a Netflix show called You, and the new full-length film, CODA, that was recently shown at the Sundance Film Festival that won one of the top three awards. It won the top three awards and it has never happened like that before in the history of that festival. It is amazing to be able to see ASL on the screen, beautifully done. And I'm looking forward to that movie's release. Now we look forward to hearing about your journey as an actor. Thanks, Ren, for that really nice, heartwarming introduction. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. Uh, I want to thank NTID for asking me to come to this and to share my experience as I grew up and became a, an accomplished actor. Uh, my journey, my story from beginning to where I am here today is what I want to share. I'll talk about what it was like growing up, what my friends thought of me, how I felt different, how my life has become different from perhaps other people. Friends have said I should write a book and perhaps I will. I always felt different myself when the way I was raised because I'm adopted. I escaped a quote unquote family um, situation where there was drug use, drug abuse, physical abuse, violence. So that's part of what I'll talk about tonight. I'm a second generation deaf person. My, both my parents, my biological parents were both deaf. And you might notice that I did sign biological and why did I sign that? Again, I'll explain. Uh, let me tell a little bit about my parents so you can get a clear picture of where I came from. Both my parents were in the Detroit, Michigan area. My father um, went into school and met my mom and they were both really young, both still in school. The time I was born, my mom was beautiful, active. A lot of people just really adored her. 
but this was prior to her becoming addicted to drugs. I think at about 13 or 14, she became involved with drugs. After they were finished with school, my biological parents fell in love with each other. At the same time, my father didn't know my mom was hooked on drugs. He had no idea. So they were dating and my mom became pregnant with me. I was born. At that time, um, they started to have some problems domestically and they split. My birth mother and her family blocked my father from even seeing me. They would not allow him to see me after I was born. And then it just so happened that one day my dad um, was just having a normal day at home. And all of a sudden there was uh, his doorbell rang. So he goes and answers the door and there he sees this person with a little baby in their arms. This woman who was not my biological mom, another woman was holding this baby, me. And my dad was wondering what happened. What had happened is my birth mother gave birth to me. She gave me to another woman to take care of me because she wanted to go out and party because she was addicted to drugs. So my birth mother's sister then decided to take care of me. So this woman actually um, was a friend of my mom's. My mom said, do you mind taking care of my son for three days? I'll be back in three days to pick him up. And this woman was a friend of my mom and said, sure, I'll take care of him. One day went by. Two days, three days, she started packing up my stuff, making me ready to go back with my mom and waited all day long. But my mother never showed. So she continued to take care of me for a month and another month. My birth ne mother never came back. So the woman decided to search for and luckily find my father and say, gosh, I think this is your son. And my dad was like, yes, well, thank you. I mean, this is my baby. I was still very small. So um, my dad decided to get in touch with his sister, my aunt, and they talked about what should happen with me. So my aunt adopted me and she had to go through the court system. And sure enough, we went into court. My birth mother never even showed up to the court. So basically my aunt got automatic custody of me and adopted me. Now, I don't remember all of this. I was quite young. I don't remember any of that. So sometimes I call my, my aunt, but I call her my mom. My biological mom, she was addicted to drugs and that whole story. I never called this woman my mom. My aunt is my mom, even though she's really my aunt. Anyway, my aunt remembers the first time we met. Now, commonly when kids are adopted, it takes some time for the families to, to get along, to bond, to really bond and be accepted as a family unit. But my personality and my aunt's personality, we were so strongly alike. The two of us had an instant bond and became a family. I mean, I trusted her. She trusted me. She became my mom. So I was adopted. Um, I was born in Detroit, Michigan. That was in 1989. And yes, I'm 31. I'm sure you were doing the math. So I was adopted. Uh, my aunt drove to Detroit and then drove me back to her hometown in Duluth, Minnesota. And that's the sign for Duluth. So Minnesota, if you don't know, is a state. And we have the largest freshwater lake, Lake Superior. It's, it's huge, the largest freshwater lake in the world. And at the very tip of that lake is Duluth. And that's where I was adopted and moved to with my aunt, my mom, and her partner. So basically, I have two moms that adopted me. At the time I was adopted, I was 18 months old. I had no language at that time, absolutely nothing. No English, no ASL, no language. I would scream and point at things if I wanted it. So my mom watched me. At that time, my mom knew a little bit of ASL, 
Um, you know, remember my aunt um, was raised with my father, who, or my biological father who was deaf. They didn't really use full ASL at home. They had home signs as they were growing up. But when my mom adopted me, she was so motivated to learn ASL to be able to teach me. So at 18 months, I started learning. For example, I would point at a bunch of grapes and I would point at them and just scream, meaning I wanted a grape. But my mom would say, nope, turn off your voice and sign grapes. So I would copy her. And that's where I started to pick up language. Um, she also bought me special children's book that had sign language and pictures in them. If you might know of Linda Bove, she, um, she was one of the founding um, members of Deaf West Theater. She had a, a picture book that I would read through every day. Also, we had VHSs back in the day. Remember, you put them in a VHS recorder and I would watch a movie. I would watch films of a gentleman named Ben Mahan. He's an amazing ASL storyteller. And that's where I really started to pick up. That's where I started to really enjoy, fall in love with and understand ASL. That was my foundation. ASL is visual, it's a 3D language. I could imagine it in the world. It was like a movie and I, I so enjoyed watching those. As I grew up, we would go to especially, I forget what they're called, a deaf family camp. I can't remember the exact name of them, but we would go to a family camp in the summertime. And those were for parents who had deaf kids and you know wanted to go to a camp so everybody could mingle and meet other deaf kids. You also met deaf adults there. And that's where I learned about deaf culture. I started to learn about deaf culture. I saw more signing and oh, one of my favorite times there was sitting around the bonfire. I'm sure you all had that experience, that huge bonfire, everybody's sitting in a circle. We can see everybody and deaf people get up and tell their stories, share them, share stories about themselves or tell deaf jokes or ASL jokes. My mother told me that, and I don't remember this really, but she told me that I would watch these stories and I would remember that person's story. And then the next person would tell a story and the next, and I would remember each one and take bits and parts. And then I would raise my hand and say, it's my turn. I want to tell a story. And they'd say, sure, come on. And I, I would remember everybody's stories and I would incorporate them into my own and sign them. I really enjoyed telling stories. I also was in, in love with trains and airplanes and would create stories about them. Now, when I was growing up, I did not think about becoming an actor in my future. I didn't think about being on TV or in films or on stage. It was never a, a dream of mine until much later in high school. My very first dream job is I wanted to become a pilot. Of course, today, I still wanna become a pilot and I think I will one day. I loved looking in the sky, watching the planes go by and the thought of being able to fly. Anytime a plane went over, I would notice it. I'd know the kinds of planes, the names of them. That was exactly what I wanted to do. That was my dream job, to be a pilot. I went to a mainstream school. It was always a struggle for me though in a mainstream school because I am a really strong ASL user. Uh, my language is very visual. And here I was with mostly hearing students. At that time, I did have a fantastic interpreter. I must say I'm very luck lucky. Uh, I had an interpreter who was a CODA, but I still struggled within the mainstream environment with all the hearing students. I was so different and I was trying to fit in and just just couldn't because of the language, the learning, it was just different and it was a, it was a struggle. In um, the mainstream school, I also had a deaf and hard of hearing teacher uh, who was hearing but knew ASL and that teacher would come to my elementary school. Every day I would have two hours with this particular teacher, one-on-one. -on -one. So this teacher helped me catch up with English and other parts of my education. And she just noticed that I absolutely adored making up stories in ASL. I was very creative. I also liked to draw a lot as well. So I was strongly drawn to the arts. So this deaf and hard of hearing teacher thought, well, I'm going 
going to write a, a children's play. And then they be, that person became a director for this play and decided to offer me the lead role in this children's play. At that time, I think I was nine years old. I didn't understand what a play was. I didn't understand any of that. But my mom said, do it, go for it. So I joined this play. And that's where I learned how, oh, you have a rehearsal process and you become a character. It's not me. It's, oh, I really enjoyed that. I loved working with the other people. I liked being on stage, having an audience there. I really enjoyed that. It was in later, you know, we, we showed this play. Now it wasn't in the little school in the cafeteria where mom and dad comes and claps and waves at you. Our play was actually presented at a public playhouse in the town in Duluth. It's called the Playhouse. They sold tickets. People actually from the community came to watch this piece. Oh, we acted, we did the production. There was some music involved. Again, remember I was nine. When the play was done, my grandfather came, my biological father came. I would see him often. I wouldn't see my biological mother, but my biological father came up from Detroit to watch me in this play. It was very exciting. After the play was done, you know, family, friends, a couple of my friends from elementary school came up to me and everybody was really congratulating me, saying what a good job I did. But, you know, I'd say thanks. I didn't really get it. I enjoyed myself. Thought I really liked the performing part. But that play closed. And I asked my moms, I wanted to be involved in some more plays. And my moms were like, yeah, let's find some place for you. So my deaf and hard of hearing teacher asked, maybe we should write a new play, you know, create something that you can work in. And I thought, yeah, that'd work, but it never happened, unfortunately. I was never involved in theater again from nine until much later, I think maybe I was in middle school when I acted again. Again, that deaf and hard of hearing teacher, I, I believe her husband passed away from cancer. So they went through hard times and couldn't create another piece. Now that I'm older, I realize that's what happened. But in this mainstream school, I struggled. I played sports. I joined the soccer team. I joined the soccer club. My moms would come and interpret. They'd switch on and off and interpret for me playing soccer. You know, I made some friends. You know, there are other hearing kids there that were my age, but as I grew, I just enjoyed my ASL storytelling. I always struggled, though, um, being in a mainstream school, but at summertime, I'd be so excited because we would go to that, that summer camp. Again, it was in Minnesota, and there was a deaf school in Minnesota, and I went to summer school once there, and there were deaf kids, everybody signing. I made friends so quickly. I saw there were deaf adults, teachers who were signing. And then also there's the deaf camp, as I described before, there were fa the family camp was different. Whereas, you know, typically I'm the only deaf person going in, but here at the deaf school, I was meeting so many deaf students. And when I was at the deaf camp, we're um, Gallaudet students. And again, I enjoyed being around deaf people during my summer times. Then fall came again. I knew I had to go back into the mainstream school. And one day I thought, I'm going to ask my moms. I said, I want to go to the deaf school. I really want to transfer to that school. My moms thought about it. And it was a really a tough decision because the deaf school in Minnesota was four hours away from where I lived. So if I go to deaf school, I would have to stay in the dorm. I would have to get up, let's say, you know, take a four hour bus trip, stay in the dorm and then visit my mom's on the weekend and then drive back and forth. So that was a negative. I would see my mom's less. 
but I knew I would enjoy being in that environment. You know, being in the deaf community, being around other people just like me. So my mom's decided yes. And then they allowed me to go to the school for the deaf. I was so excited. I was so thankful that they finally allowed me to transfer the to the school for the deaf. I was so much happier there. I had so many new friends. Everybody signed. I was thrilled to be there. And I joined all of their sports teams. I played football and basketball, track and field. Uh, so I was a, a strong athlete. When I was on the football team, we would play against other schools for the deaf in other states. So we would all pile onto a bus and go to different states, which was really neat because I've traveled all over the United States, meeting different deaf people with their different signing accents. It was a really strong deaf world and deaf community. And it caught me up on the deaf culture that I had been lacking and the sign language that I had been lacking. So not only that, but I also was in the school plays at that school for the deaf. Now I was in that one play when I was nine. And like I said, I wasn't in another until I came to the school for the deaf. I loved it. The teachers there, the staff members at the school, um, even my friends too would always come up to me afterwards and tell me they loved my expression and the way that I signed on stage. And I didn't really understand at the time that it meant that I was talented. And, you know, at the time I would just say thank you. And I honestly just enjoyed what I was doing. I loved being on stage. It felt like home to me. I just, you know, it has like a smell, a very unique theater smell. And it just, feels like home and it makes me happy. At the same time, I still wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I didn't have that dream of being a professional actor yet. I wanna show you a picture. Um, it's a baby picture and then I have a couple others to show you. Here's a picture of me as a baby. I was adopted. Um, at some point before this. This is one of the only baby pictures of myself that I have. I've asked if there are others and I don't think there are. And I'm wondering who took this picture. I don't know if it was my biological mother or father, but this is one of the only ones I have. Now this is when I was officially adopted and I was living with my moms. So that's what I looked like as a child. I looked happy. And I honestly, I really came from a pretty bad experience, but I don't remember any of it. So I just wanted to show that to you. So here's another picture. This is when I had started learning sign language and here I'm signing deer. Uh, I always loved animals. I'm an animal person. I uh, hope you are too. So remember I was telling you about the books. So here's the books that I, I was mentioning by Linda Bove. These aren't actually my books. I found them online. Um, this, I found the picture online, but these are the books that I used and I learned some signs from the books. Do you all know who Ben Bahan is? Some of you may not know, so I'm just going to show you a quick video just so you can get an idea of who he was. The fisherman grabbed it, pulled it into the boat, held the fish, and took the hook out of its mouth. The fisherman could see the gills moving as he looked at the fish, and the fish began to talk. So that's Ben Bahan. That was an old videotape. And you can see his expression and the way that he signs. When I watched that, I wanted to be him. And so that I think uh, led me to the way that I sign on stage and the way that I express myself. So I'm very thankful to Ben Bahan and Linda Bove. Now, when I was in high school, it was my junior year. There was a new teacher that came into the school and I have to, I just have to tell you her name because she really 
changed my life. Um, and she is one reason why I got the dream to be an actor. Her name is Pam Wright. So Pam was a new teacher at the school, my junior year in high school at the School for the Deaf. She taught English and some other classes, but she also introduced a drama theater class. Um, we had never had a drama course offered. You know, we had had plays on stage that I acted in, but not an official class about acting. So Pam added this course and I was so excited to take it. Now, one day I actually got in an argument with another student you know, in high school, kids don't make the best decisions and there's always a lot of drama. I definitely thought that I was a jock and I had that same attitude. And, you know, I was looking at the seniors with that same attitude and I, I wanted to be them. And Pam saw me acting like this and she saw that fight with the other student. And I really said some pretty hurtful things that I regret. We're still friends, but I really do regret the things that I said. Pam saw and she said, uh, Daniel, I'd like for you to stay after class. So when the students left, you know, I of course rolled my eyes because she wanted me to stay after, but the bell rang, students left and I stayed and had a little one-on-one -on -one chat with Pam. She said something that really changed me. She said, you have talent as an actor. You have the expression, the signing, the physicality. You can be famous, you could be successful, but you need to do the right thing. And that got me, that really got me. She really got through to me. And from that point on, I, I changed who I am. I really had a lot of faith in Pam's advice. She had a lot of experience. She was interested in Shakespeare. She had theater experience. She had Gallaudet theater experience. She had it all. So I trusted her. And so that at that point, was when I started to dream about being a professional actor. After that, it really changed who I am. You know, sports were still important, but I didn't want to be a pro athlete anymore. I wanted to graduate high school and be an actor. Then when it was my senior year of high school, I still had Pam as a teacher. She encouraged me to join a show at a mainstream school just down the road. She really did want me to join this play just to get the experience of working with a company of all hearing people. I had plenty of experience with deaf directors and deaf companies. But, you know, the School for the Deaf community was small and she encouraged me to get out and have a different experience. So she actually drove me to that school for my audition. So the word audition means to try out for a play. So she drove me to my audition and they liked what I showed them and they picked me. Um, we had to rehearse during the week and on weekends. I remember my home was four hour away and I couldn't miss rehearsal. So Pam actually invited me to stay at her home over the weekends. And I actually was friends with her son. Uh, her son is a CODA. Um, he's a pretty big guy. I think he's three years younger than me and he was a, a big um, football and rugby player, um, but a very big heart and a very kind person. So anyways, she allowed me to stay at her place on those weekends for rehearsal. So when I was in those productions, when I was at the deaf school, I thought I was it. But then 
the hearing production was completely different. We wanted all to support each other and have that camaraderie. But me as a deaf person, I felt like maybe I couldn't, but they invited me in. And it, it was a, a fantastic experience. So after graduation, I applied to college and I came to NTID RIT. You know, it was getting close to my high school graduation and I finally found out that I was accepted. And in the hall at high school, they would flash the lights when anybody got accepted to a college. And so I graduated finally from high school and came to NTID. And right before that, in 2007, over the summer, I wasn't working. I was staying home and I was kind of bored. So I decided to vlog some ASL stories and some deaf jokes and just different videos, little clips where I would add some effects and then post them to YouTube. And that is how I started growing my fan base. Their comments were always positive and they liked seeing my expression and my signing and they always looked forward to seeing more of my work. So then that fall, I came to NTID. My old major was ACT, sort of like information technology. Um, I really love tech. I love computers and video games, um, anything tech related I love. So I thought that might be a good major for me. I really did like it. It was a, it was a great major. Um, I really liked my college life at NTID. I met a lot of new friends and I was here for three and a half years but always in the back of my mind, there was that nagging feeling that I needed to do something with acting. And I just, I knew that I needed to do something. I took a drama class at NTID and it was so fun and I really enjoyed it, but I knew that I wanted to make a career out of this or a major in it or something. So Gallaudet University was calling my name so I decided to make the switch to Gallaudet University. It was a hard decision to make. I had a lot of friends at NTID. I had a lot of support, but people said, yeah, you want to be an actor, go. So I transferred to Gallaudet. And I tell you, I just hit the wall there. I auditioned for several plays there. I didn't get cast. I was quite frustrated. And at the same time though, college just wasn't for me. I had lost interest in that. So I thought I need to take a break from college and really figure out what is next for me. Should I keep acting? Should I keep with that goal? So I left Gallaudet. I um, had moved to the East Coast. I was living in Maryland. And to be honest, that was a rather depressing time. I was trying to be an actor, but again, was failing. I just, at that time, I thought, you know, I can't do this. But again, I am stubborn. I know inside that I could, it would just take time. And during that time, I also continued with my vlogs on YouTube and my family was very supportive. My moms would tell me, always think positively, the right time, the right place, it'll happen for you, keep going. So I did, I kept posting on YouTube. One day I get an email and it's from a manager, which is sort of like an agent, an agent slash manager. And their job is to look for film work, TV work for, if there's a deaf role, then they will send off deaf actors to audition. And if you get the role, then you pay them 10% of what you earn. That's basically the agency or manager's job. At that time, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a manager. Nobody knew who I was, but I get this email um, from Los Angeles saying, hey, we've seen your YouTube and we really like it. I guess they were impressed with what I was doing. They were impressed with my work. 
So they wanted to see if they could work with me. It wasn't a definite decision, but we would just see how it would go. And they told me that they had an audition for Deaf West Theater, which is in Los Angeles. Deaf West is the only deaf professional theater um, that we have. And it was established in 89, 1989 in Los Angeles, California. And I thought, whoa, this is great. This is a professional deaf company. I've always wanted to work with them. So yeah. And now they warned me, you have to fly out to LA and meet them in person to audition. I thought, okay, but that was a week away. So I had one week to get myself to Los Angeles, California. At that time, I was broke. I did not have money. I was eking out a living. But I thought, this is what I want. This is the opportunity. I have to take it. So I found the cheapest flight I could find. I found a hotel online. It looked fantastic in West Hollywood is where the hotel was. It looked great online. So I booked a room. I flew off to LA, arrived. I was met by the manager who had a very, very fancy car and the shades. And we put my luggage in the car. And this was the first time I ever saw LA. It was gorgeous. The palm trees everywhere as we're driving. See the sun. It was clean. There's all the, the sky was not a cloud in the sky, bright sun. It's my first time I was so excited. We drove and we found my hotel. We arrived and looked at it. I felt awful. This hotel on the internet where I booked it, oh, it looked fantastic, but it was in one of the worst areas in town. I'm embarrassed because here I am, you know, seeing this hotel with this manager who's in their fancy car. And I would think, the manager said to me, are you sure you want to sleep here? And I said, well, I've got no choice. Where else can I sleep? I guess I'll, you know, I can't stay with the manager. I just met them. So I decided, yeah, I'll stay at this hotel. And the manager said, all right, then off you go. I went into the hotel room and I was okay. At that time, um, going to Los Angeles, California, I had videotaped myself some signing. I showed, you know, fans on YouTube were excited to see what I was doing. I was vlogging about my trip. So I think in the background, you can see uh, this hotel it was just awful, but I'll show you a clip of what I was doing then. And then the video is saying, uh, I have it at 12.30 in the morning. I couldn't sleep because I'm so nervous. I keep thinking about the audition that I have tomorrow. This is a huge deal for me. The biggest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah, I've done stuff in college and high school. So that's me in my hotel room. After my manager had dropped me off, I was so restless. I was so nervous. I practiced my lines over and over again. I wanted to be ready for that Deaf West audition. I wanted to show them that I was passionate and wanted to be a part of them. I can remember I stayed up, I guess, till 1230 in the morning. I didn't even remember that. But yes, I stayed up. I finally got some sleep. The next morning, my manager came, picked me up and drove me. They asked me, are you ready? Do you have your resume with you? Do you have your headshot already? And I did. Asked, are you, do you have all your lines down? I said, yes, I'm ready. I was so nervous, but yeah, I thought I was ready. My manager dropped me off at Deaf West. They went off to a coffee shop, not very far from the theater. And in I went. I thought it would be this huge theater where actors would come in and they would say, okay, next. And I would go in and say a few lines, but I was wrong. Everybody was so friendly. They asked me how I was, what's your name? So I introduced myself, hi, I'm Daniel. I came from Maryland, so I'm here to audition. And they said to me, wow, you flew all this way. That's amazing. Okay, go ahead. Let's see, let's see what you got. So my heart was pounding out of my chest. If, uh, if there was an EKG machine hooked up to me, it would be off the chart. 
I do remember that I messed up one of the lines, but I finished my audition. I looked at their faces and they were all smiling and nodding. They seemed to enjoy my work. So I said, thank you. And that's it. And they said, it, you know, it was maybe 30 seconds audition. I mean, you know, buying an airline ticket, going to that hotel for 30 seconds. I thought, wow, that's it. Okay. But inside I felt good. I thought I had done a good job. At the same time though, I thought, I doubt I will get this role. I mean, I just don't think it's possible. I tried to think positive. It was good that I had gotten there though, that they knew my name, they saw my face, they saw my passion, that I had come all this way. So I went outside and met back up with my manager at the coffee shop who asked how to go. And I said, oh, it went great, I guess. And my manager was convinced I was gonna get this role. I thought, well, fingers crossed, I hope so. So then I asked, how long do you think it'll take for them to figure out what their casting is gonna look like? And they told me, oh, probably a week. You know, I kind of went around LA, got an idea of what it was like, what it looked like. The next day I flew back home to Maryland. And of course, every day in the morning for that week, I would check my phone, I would check my email. Did I get it? Did I not get it? That whole week, I heard nothing. And I thought, well, obviously that means I did not get the role. Well, it was a good experience. Hopefully they'll remember me, remember my name. Then the second week came and I was feeling a bit down. I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what am I gonna do next? Should I go back to another college? Should I go home? I just was unsure of what I wanted to do. So that second week went by, one morning I get up and I look at my phone and there's a text. My manager saying, all in caps, saying, congratulations, you got the role. They've offered you the role, all in caps. I mean, I wasn't even awake and I'm looking at this. So I had to read it over and over again, just to double check to make sure that I really got that role. And sure enough, I did. I was shocked. I was excited. I mean, that means I'm going to have to move to LA, to California, and start working in a professional theater. I mean, I'm going to be in a professional show. But sure enough, you know, they sent me the schedule, what the rehearsal schedule was like, and what I needed to do to get there. And I mean, it was real. I remember that and then I moved out to Los Angeles, California for that show and settled there. Doing the play at Deaf West, went through the rehearsal process. It was a great experience. I really enjoyed that. I mean, before rehearsal started, I had heard that there was one actor involved in the play. His name is Troy Kotsor. I had heard about him. I didn't know who he was, but I thought, oh, okay, great. I met him. It's a great guy. We chatted. And then when he started in rehearsal, he started acting and he started signing. My jaw dropped. He was gorgeous. His signing was gorgeous. His physicality on stage was amazing. I couldn't believe it. And that's really where I became, he became a hero of mine. He was definitely a role model. I'll show you a picture of him. This was the first play I was involved in at Deaf West. That's Troy. He had the lead role in this play. And I'm the one in, the, in that cap and the plaid shirt. That was my very first Deaf West production I was in. At that time, it was a small role, but still is a great experience. I learned so much. You know, Deaf West has been going for many years and they, you know, had a shared experience that I could learn from. I really liked working in this role. That's where I started to grow my network within California, started to get to know people. Oh, I almost forgot to tell you at Deaf West, the play was Cyrano. I think that was in 2013, 2012, 2013. I was 22, enjoyed myself so much. Now, during that time, when we were doing Cyrano, my manager, 
was working with people that were in Switched at Birth. It was a television show on ABC Family. Now it's uh, what's now called Freeform. But my manager typically was sending extras to work on Switched at Birth. Now an extra is, you know, if you're watching a TV show or a film, you see the main characters, you know, doing their lines back and forth. And in the background, you'll see people walking by or sitting at tables nearby. That's an extra, or they're called background players. So my manager typically sent people to work as extras on Switch to Birth. And my manager asked me, do you want to be an extra on Switch to Birth? And I said, yeah, sure I want to. I'd never had any experience on um, a TV show. Um, so yeah, I said, sure, absolutely. Um, I wanted to get an idea of what it was like on a TV set, how they set lights, how they set the cameras, how it all works. And I really enjoyed that experience. All I had to do as an extra, for example, there was one scene that's in a high school. So I was dressed like a high school kid. I had my backpack on. And the crew would tell you, okay, you're going to walk straight down the hall. And they would tell me when to go and I would walk past the main characters who are having some dialogue in the scene and I would walk past them. That's all I did. That's what extra work is. And I was looking at them got, thinking, gosh, I really would love to be an actual main character on Switched at Birth. In the back of my head, I thought, you know, one day, maybe that'll happen. So time went on and actually one day they had auditions for a role. I went and auditioned and I got it. I actually got a role where I could act. And then that led to me being involved at um, Spring Awakening and this and the movie Coda, which I was in recently. But I do want to thank Deaf West Theater because they truly opened the door for me to become successful in acting. I know I've been talking a lot, but now um, I'm, you know, I wanted to talk about my journey and how I became successful but I wanna say thanks to my moms who adopted me and got me out of a really bad situation, taught me ASL, where I really became, where it just matched my skills with acting, which I really enjoy. And I just love theater. It's a place to learn. I love to learn about the characters, their emotions, their experiences and become that character. It's just something I enjoy to do. It is time for me to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you for watching and learning about my journey. Um, thank you to NTID and RIT for bringing me here. I'm really happy to be here at my old home. Also, thank you to the interpreters for interpreting into English my presentation. Thank you all and have a good night. Take care.